We begin with the order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and night, word of truth, wind sweeping over the waters. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and refuge, we pour out our hearts before you. We have known you, but have not always loved you. We have wounded one another and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. Remember your covenant. Renew your creation. Restore us, that we might proclaim your good news to all. Amen. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. God has spoken. The time of grace is now. In Jesus, the reign of God has come near. By the authority of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are God's beloved. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord.
Let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone, you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. According to Mark, glory to you, O Lord. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, for those of you who are parents or are around small children, you know it's always interesting to watch our children grow and develop and take on traits, habits, and personalities of parents and other extended family members. It is amazing sometimes the things that our children say that mimic us, that copy us, and some of those sometimes to our great chagrin. Other times it has us holding our heads up high and proud, with hopefully more of the latter. With certain personality qualities and behaviors, sometimes there are quite the pendulum swings from generation to generation. For example, I have witnessed greatly extroverted parents who then have very introverted children. Maybe it's because the kids can never get a word in edgewise. Or sometimes they see the parent constantly in the limelight and they think that is the opposite of what they want for themselves and vice versa. I had a seminary classmate by the name of Roy Rogers. And every semester, having a new professor on that first day of class, when they came to his name on the roster, they would always stop and say, Roy Rogers, where's your horse? Or some joke to that effect. Turns out his sister's name was Ginger, Ginger Rogers. The naming was not by accident. Upon sharing his story, he said that his mother was very painfully shy growing up, very introverted, always wanting to hide and not wanting to be seen or recognize, and she regretted the opportunities missed. So she intentionally named her children with famous names so that they would stand out, at least in some way, right from the get-go. In my son Theo, I have a growing individual who has a developing personality, and thus far in his six-year-old life, as they often say, he is not the first guy in the pool. In other words, he plays it safe. He is cautious. He asks a lot of questions of a situation before he commits to doing anything. Even when presented with a piece of candy, he will ask, well, what kind of candy is this? What does it taste like? Will I like it? And if there's any hedging on our part, any possibility of dealing with something unknown, He'll take a pass on it, even with candy. Now, I have to admit, and Karen has too, that this trait of his is an example of the apple not falling far from the tree. Both of Theo's parents, myself and Karen, were the type of kids, at least in our younger years, that looked 
before they leapt, leaped, so to speak. This often has been a common theme in my life when it came and when it still comes to important choices that may have a significant outcome for me. I typically am not a knee-jerk reactor, at least not on the outside. Inside, I may be reacting at times, but I try not to show it on the outside most of the time. I've often said, if you see me running or jogging, you better get up and run too, because it means something bad must be happening behind me, because that's the only reason that I would be running in the first place. In other words, I typically do not jump quickly into things. I often seek to be the owl in the tree before making big choices. Well, today in our gospel text, we have yet another story about the calling of the dozen disciples by the great rabbi, the teacher, the Messiah, Jesus. It is a familiar text, especially if we're privileged enough to grow up in Sunday school. For whatever reason, this becoming fishers of men or fishers of people not only became a common Sunday school song, but a common lesson that was shared to our children about being disciples of Jesus. In this text, in these four verses, we have Jesus calling for the disciples. And in this case, unlike Philip and Nathaniel last Sunday, these four disciples are pretty well known to us. Simon, Peter, and Andrew, James, and John. These are probably ones that most people would easily list when trying to think of the names of those original disciples. But yet here, in just a few words, we have this recording of their eureka moments of their lives. This encounter with Christ that forever alters their future and in turn the world's future and of course, even our future. What we are told is that when they have this encounter with Jesus, all of them immediately leave their lives behind to follow this man. The text uses the word immediately several times when talking about these men choosing to follow Christ. In fact, the entire Gospel of Mark is populated with verses that contain this Greek word immediately. In fact, if you were to see a Gospel pa passage in front of you and it contained the word immediately, you'd be able to guess with a very high probability that the passage comes from the Gospel of Mark. The writer of Mark gives an almost breathless account of the urgency and the movement and the mission of Jesus and its importance to its ministry, its purpose for the world, and the priority to share this with others. Perhaps we may wonder, if I had encountered Jesus in that day in this way, would we also immediately leave our life behind to follow him into the unknown? As I mentioned earlier, I typically am not a person to do many things immediately. I can wonder what I would have done that day on the banks of the Sea of Galilee if Christ would have come up to me and said, follow me. I think I might have had a few more questions like, well, what do I need to pack? Where are we going? How long will this take? Will I be back? When you say, follow me, what exactly are you asking me to do? Do I have to sign anything? Can I quit when I want to? Am I free to come home? How much actual sacrifice is going to be required on my part? What's the pay rate? What days do I get off? What's the vacation time like? How much luggage can I bring? Can I invite friends? Is drinking allowed? What if I don't agree with something? These are a list of questions that may be in various and different ways that we ask of our lives, ask of ourselves, of our vocation, of our decisions when we are trying to map out a future action. It is simply amazing that these individuals are not recorded as really 
asking any questions or seemingly interested in doing so? Was it that they were all at points in their lives in which they were ready for something different to occur? Was it that in their own ways and in their own minds, they were already searching for the Messiah and Jesus met those hopes? Perhaps was it Jesus himself in his magnetism, his aura, his charisma that just caught them up so much that resistance was futile and they just knew. Many of us are familiar with the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, which tells of another type of a call of a man about a man called Jonah, who upon hearing that God wants him to follow and deliver a message to the people, his first reaction is to run the opposite way. He tries to hide from God, tries to escape God, to wield off any of this prophet-like talk. So we have the contrast between those who immediately respond to Jesus and those who, when they are even given a special invitation from the voice of God, say, I'm out of here. It's quite the spectrum of response. But here's the thing. In the story of Jonah and in the lives of these disciples, all of them, in the end, become followers of God's direction. All of them, in some type of way, are grasped from within, and perhaps even from outside, to seek a path to share the word of God with others. The call of these disciples this morning reminds us that the call can come to us in various and different types of ways. For some, they have an experience in which they can point to the minute and the hour, their eureka moment occurred, when it occurred, in discovering a faith path in Christ. Others take time to warm up to certain ideas and issues and certain decisions, but are no less committed in the end. All of us have a call from God. All of us can hear the words of Jesus who beckons us to respond when he says, follow me. So last week I ended with a question of where are you looking for your eureka moment with God? Today I ask, how was your call on Sunday, January 21st, 2024, directing your life this day, this week, this month, this year, this lifetime. Amen.
us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayers of intercession. As we celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessing on the church, the world, and all of creation. God, our rock and deliverance, do not let your church be shaken. We trust you never abandon your promises to the most vulnerable among us. Give your church wisdom and empathy in its varied ministries. God of grace, receive our prayer. God, our hope and refuge, you place the fish in the sea. Guide our care of oceans and all creatures that live in them. Hold us accountable for actions that endanger water sources and the people who depend on them. God of grace, receive our prayer. God who proclaims judgment and offers mercy, be a model to the leaders of our nation and the world, especially in places of war such as Ukraine and the Middle East. May they follow in your way of justice and truth. God of grace, receive our prayer. God who cares for the suffering, care for the survivors of assault and sexual abuse and sustain all who minister to them. Keep safe any who live under the threat of violence, those living in poverty, and any among us who are ill or in pain. God of grace, receive our prayer. God of resurrection and new life, as the first disciples shared the good news, empower us and this faith community to be open to your call. When we are uncertain of your call, assure us. When we have strayed from your ways, redirect us. God of grace, receive our prayer. God who holds the saints against your tender bosom, we trust you welcome those and all into your care. Comfort those who grieve, even as we place our hope in your salvation. God of grace, hear our prayer. Knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may God who named you, Christ who claimed you, and the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, bless you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace. You are God's beloved. Thanks be to God.